to hear. Awesome. Um, so Faye, if you wanna kick off. Yes. Well, welcome everyone to Data Talks, challenging the Asian Pacific Islander glass ceiling through employee resource group advocacy. My name is Faye Sahai from Vinaj Ventures and Ascend Leadership. Today's event is sponsored by Asian Leaders Alliance and Ascend Leadership. Asian Leaders Alliance is a coalition of 200 plus corporate Asian ERGs, which include organizations, individuals, and allies. The mission is to equip, empower, and enable Asian Pacific Islander ERG members and allies to grow as civic leaders and advocate for the communities we serve. Ascend Leadership has a very complementary uh, mission too, as the largest pan-Asian business professional membership organization in North America. Our mission is to drive workplace and societal impact by developing and elevating all Asian Pacific Islander business leaders and empowering them to be catalysts for change. We offer career life cycle and cross-industry leadership programs and networks. What you're seeing here is at the Ascend Foundation, um, we are a data-driven approach to research and measure and analyze the progress we are making as Pan-Asians and other minorities in leadership roles and identifying factors that contribute to this leadership gap. Today, we'll be hearing from two of the greatest researchers that we have at Ascend Foundation, Denise Peck and Buck G, who have conducted extensive research on the glass ceiling that face Pacific Islanders. You'll see several of their research papers here and I'll post that as well in the chat. We'll learn how we can, we can represent ourselves, but strategies to leverage for data accuracies in your companies. I'll now pass it off to Julie. Thank you for that welcome, Faye. Hi everyone, my name is Julie and I'm one of the, um, part of the leadership team for Asian Leaders Alliance and also am a product marketer at Twilio. I am so privileged and honored today to be hosting our panel um, with Denise Peck and Buck G. For those of you who don't know, Denise um, was previously a director and VP at Sun Microsystems and Cisco. Her passion for helping professionals reach their career goals led her to be an executive advisor for Ascent Leadership, who's hosting our event today. Um, Denise continues to develop and teach leadership workshops and has co-authored um, many research papers, which details the underrepresentation of ethnic minorities in US private sectors. We also have Buck here today, um, who retired in 2008 from Cisco, where he was both the VP and GM of the data center business unit. Since then, he's founded the Advanced Leadership Program for Asian American Executives at Stanford Business School. Buck serves on a number of boards and committees, including Committee of 100, Asia Society Northern California, and is president of Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation. Um, just so you all know, we will, we will be doing Q&A Q &A at the end. There's a Slido link at the bottom of the slide, so feel free to log in there um, and submit any questions. Awesome. And I think someone's going to pin our speakers, Buck and Denise, so welcome, and a virtual clap <laughs> um, and to have you both on stage. Now, just to level set, the glass ceiling, I think we've all heard this terminology before, you know, it's that barrier to advancement that we face in the workplace. Um, you know, it keeps us from reaching that next level of leadership, maybe that promotion, and this is something that Buck, you and Denise have done a lot of research in, is this Asian glass ceiling. Now, can you talk about how you've seen this glass ceiling play out in your lives and what made you want to embark upon this research? Yeah. Uh, let me start uh, just with a, a quick story. Um, I, I was um, uh, just going through my career, um, you know, starting as an engineer and uh, getting into management and ultimately becoming a uh, CEO of a of a startup that was acquired by Cisco, um, and uh, and 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 my epiphany was that when I was uh, at Cisco in 2006, um, I realized uh, that I was the only East Asian vice president in development in an organization that was roughly 25% uh, East Asian. Uh, I was one out of 104, and uh, when Denise moved over from marketing to development. There were two out of 105, um, and and we we decided uh, this is not right, and we need to do something about it. So um, that was how I got involved. 
Denise got involved earlier. And Denise can tell you her story, but about how she yeah. got involved with diversity. So I've been involved with diversity and um, inclusion and initiatives for a long time in my career. In the early part of my career, starting with Sun Microsystems and then on to Cisco, it was really all about gender equality and it was about promoting women and especially promoting women as they go through and climb the corporate ladder to executive ranks. And that was really the focus back in the 90s and the aughts. Um, and when Buck tapped me on the shoulder and said, you know, there's this Asian uh, issue. How would you like to join me in solving for this issue? I said, what issue? And so when I looked at statistics, uh, just like we're going to look at some of the data today, I was completely dumbfounded by how underrepresented the Asians were, especially East Asians in our organization. So I joined Buck in that journey back in 2006. And here we are many years later, and uh, we're still collaborating. I love that so much. And I think it's great to see how I think a lot of times with diversity, we look at it like what with one single lens, right? Whether it's like Asians or it's women. And now we're seeing more and more that intersectionality that's happening. Um, so I think that's a great like story to how you how you both came together. Um, so for those of you, for those in the audience who may not have read any of your reports yet, you use this um, term, this metric called Executive Parity Index, or EPI for short. Um, what is EPI? How do you define it? Yeah, I'll take that one. So uh, the EPI really stems out of the data that we had access to. So I would like to give a little introduction of the data that underpins a lot of our reports with Ascend. So every year, um, all companies with more than 100 employees have to file a confidential uh, report to the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, EEOC, and it's called the EEO-1 report. This report provides a racial and gender breakdown of employees by job categories. And, and uh, so it has individual contributors, managers, executives, which are three out of the nine job categories that it tracks. For our purposes, when looking at the minority, looking at ascension into executive ranks, these are the proper categories to look at in white collar, collar uh, professions, right? So if you think of it, um, we talk about representation, but what is really important here is the representation of um, at all levels by gender and race of professionals, managers, and executives. So there's a um, analytical tool that we created uh, with our first paper hidden in plain sight, and we called it the Executive Parity Index. And it's a very simple and intuitive way to analyze um, data, representation data uh, at the top and at the bottom. So if you go to the next slide, um, a simple way of uh, calculating that index is simply that you take the percentage of any particular cohort. So let's just say black women, uh, the number of black women as a percentage of all executives, for instance, black women executives, all executives in a particular industry or company divided by the number and therefore percentage of black women professionals in that same company or industry, you get a uh, comparison, right? You get this index. If the index is over one, if it's above one, then you have an overrepresentation. If it's below one, you have an underrepresentation. Parity means that you have you know, the same proportion at the top that you do at the bottom. We really like this. Because what it really means is that you can now take a look at um, comparisons across companies, irrespective of whether a company has larger headcount than another company. You can also look at it uh, at gross levels with the uh, data that we have at different industries when the numbers are very large and compare across industries. Um, now, the EEOC has this aggregate database that, we've been, that Buck has been mining for years now. And it gives us some sense as to what at the top level for national and for regional data, what that executive parity index looks like. We've published at least three or four papers based on this EPI metric. And, and, and the reason it's important is because um, just a real simple example, a story when I was, again, when I was at Cisco. Um, at the time, in terms of, in, in just development, 21% uh, of the, of the executives of the VPs um, were Asian, either South or East Asian. And people, I would hear, there's a lot of Asian VPs here. Look, there's 21%, uh, 21, 20, 21%, because they think, well, the population is 6%. But then, then I would point out, well, that's 21%. 
of at the high level. But if you look at the bottom level, that in, in terms of the whole population, it was almost 60%. So people hadn't thought about 21 20% compared to what? So this compares to the proper context from the bottom to the top. What's the progression? And and as and Denise said, and then once it's normalized, you can compare it across cohorts, across companies, across industries. Right. You know, the analogy to that is when we show some of our data to people, uh, executives um, at different companies, um, I think the analogy is that when you go to, to the campus of any one of these tech companies that are in the Bay Area where Buck and I reside, whether it be Facebook, any of the bank companies, for instance, you see a lot of Asians pre-pandemic on campus. You see them in the cafeteria, you see them in the break room, you see them in the sea of offices and open offices. However, it's, the problem is really when you get to the C-suite, you get to the boardroom, you don't, you stop seeing them uh, in the same proportionate representation. Yeah. That's think, the glass ceiling. Yeah, I think that's a great call out. And, you know, sticking on this line of data, you know, I think there's obviously that assumption and like you, what you've just said that, you know, as we get higher up, we're not seeing that same representation, right? Whether Asians in the boardroom, Asian Pacific Islanders, right. you know and the C-suite, um, can we dive into the numbers a little bit to see exactly what um, the, like the research and all that mining you did showed? Sure, um, well, uh, if you wanna go next slide, I'll, I'll, let me preface it with a bit of, a bit of uh, information. So um, Denise referenced EEOC data and EEOC provides data, and this is uh, aggregated from all the EO and reports um, at the national level, and at the regional level uh, by industry and by um, race and gender. Um, so at the highest level, um, what we have here is um, uh, aggregated industry. So all industries, all companies in the United States, US workforce, comparison of the EPI of um, race and gender. Again, the, the, the ratio is percentage at the top, executives, the top three layers of management, and the and the, and compared to the bottom, the white collar professional workforce, okay, the most likely to, uh, to 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 come from the bottom of the top. And so, what you see here, and let's say this is, I'll just take the 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 highest level here. White men is on the left, and that's a I think like one point seven eight, I think it's above one point seven five. That is to say. Compared to the representation at the as in the white collar workforce, white men are seventy five percent overrepresented or above parity compared to the numbers in the white collar force at the bottom. Okay, you look at the right hand side, and I won't go through everyone. You see Asian women, and the number there is probably point two seven or so, a little a little over twenty five percent. Asian women are compared to they're 75, roughly 75% underrepresented. So the, the extremities are, and the, and the data shows exactly that uh, the quantify, basically it quantifies the discrepancy because of normalized data and you can pair across race and gender. So you can see uh, white men, and this is nationally, then Hispanic men, uh, white women, Asian men, black men, Hispanic women, black women, and Asian women. So the nice thing is that you can see that basically, except for uh, white men, everybody is unrepresented and what some more unrepresented than others. Um, to the point of how like all the way on the right or left, depending on how you unlock the screen, there's Asian women. Um, Denise, can you talk to a little bit of like just double clicking into, you know, Asian women um, and that like intersectionality that we have there and like in on the EPI chart? Yes, there are a couple of, couple of things I'd like to mention. First of all, the chart that you're seeing is based on 2018 national data across all sectors, right? Um, so it's a pretty large population. The number of professionals included in this at the base, it's about 12 million um, professionals of all races and all gender. Asian women, we've been studying this kind of chart for a long time. And every chart that I've seen, whether it's based on Bay Area, so you know, uh, high tech industry, based on national data, national tech, right? Asian women have come down always at the bottom, tied for the bottom or at the bottom. And so uh, I think there is this intersectionality effect where there is a traditional gender um, biases at work. 
And there are also the racial issues at work. And interestingly enough, although we don't have uh, the data here to show on this chart, every analysis that we have shown for all minorities, the racial gap is actually higher in, from an EPI perspective than just a gender gap alone. Okay, so there is a real phenomenon with the intersection of not just gender, but race intersected with that. And so it's a little dispiriting, but um, it, it is true that minority women tend to be at the bottom, but I've consistently seen Asian women at the very bottom. The, 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 other, the other thing, I mean, with regard to the race and gender question, um, and, and this is another chapter, let me, let me finish up Denise's comment, um, it, is that um, is that um, in terms of minority women, um, the, the change or last, I think we look back in 20, 2007 to 2018, and there's been very little change for minority women. So whereas there's some gains in terms of the gender gap, um, that's not true for Black, Hispanic, or Asian women. So, um, to, so, so certainly our take on that is, see my take on that is, in terms of gender programs that companies are looking at, there should be a racial component to that, um, to that pro those programs too, to, to address the racial part of the gaps. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you wanna to go to the, we have more data if you wanna to go to the next slide um, and um, there's an, another aspect of it. Um, uh, this is a little, um, this, this is a little uh, complicated. I think mean, Denise and I've said, um, um, what we wanna show is, that, and this is of the Bay Area, for those companies in the Bay Area, um, um, we want to look at the Bay Area um, and, and certain industries in the Bay Area. And in particular, um, if, uh, I, um, the, the one on the left, 52, I believe, is professional services. Um, this is, so these are the ratios, the EPIs for white men, white women, and so forth, um, for for uh, for the section 52, which is professional services, blue is the aggregate for the Bay Area. Um, 33 is manufacturing companies like um, HP, Intel, uh, IBM. The next one, uh, 54, is it's a code 54, is um, um, financial services, and then the last one, 51, is information. For example, Facebook and Google. Um, Twitter, companies like that. Um, and what you, what you see uh, across all industries is the same general pattern, okay? In the Bay Area, it's a little bit different uh, in, in that the, the highest EPIs, in fact, the only EPIs above one are for white men and white women. Uh, for for uh, black, Hispanic, and Asian men and women, they're all below parity. Um, and, and, and again, at the bottom, what do you see in almost all industries and in the aggregate are Asian women. So the point that Denise made earlier about on the double glass ceiling, um, we found in the aggregate and in, in, in the major sectors. And these are the sectors that, that are most populated by Asian men and women. So that's why we included these. Okay. Uh, and that's, the, that's really the takeoff is that is the comments we're making generally that we saw nationally. Uh, we see in the same in this region, and and we've seen in every region that we've looked at, and in almost all industries, uh, the gen gender characteristics are the same. Um, uh, minority men and women are below parity, and generally Asian women in most cases are the are the lowest, and in right. many cases Asian men are the lowest of any men. Right. And that's a nice so that's what, a, so a nice tool to compare across industry, cross region, cross sector. Right. I mean, said another way, if you look at the bottom of the chart versus uh, at the right versus the left, it means that compared with white men, men, Asian women, my, white men are three to four times more likely to be executives than Asian women. And that's been a consistent conclusion that when we look at a lot of different data. It's not always the same, but the, the overall results are the same. So we have a lot of work to do here. Uh, we, and look, and also the, the other thing in looking at the data, um, Julia, I, I hate that, I, I feel like we're, we're, we're throwing so much out there that no, no one will uh, remember all this. The main things that we've seen is that uh, in the last 10 years, 
there's been very little change. So, so Asian women and Asian men are underrepresented relative to numbers of workforce, which is people surprise most non-Asians. And in the last 10 years, there's been very little change in that dynamic, even though there are more and more Asians. In fact, um, in, in Silicon Valley and in, in Bay Area, there are more Asians in white collar workforce than any other, any other uh, race. There's been little change in terms of promotion rates. They're still the least likely to be promoted. I think that's definitely a staggering stat. And I think that's a lot of that misconception that happens, right? Like you, when folks look around the workplace and they see a lot of Asian Pacific Islander colleagues, they feel that like the representation is there. But when we are looking higher up, um, that parity is definitely not there. And just for folks to know, we will be um, distributing these slides as well. So you can have this and we want to equip you um, with this data to sort of help you as you move forward. Um, and sort of a, when we're equipping folks with this data, um, you know, now we're seeing what the glass ceilings look like, how to calculate it. Um, how would you recommend executives, your G leaders or audience member using this data? Like, what can they do with this? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. I'll just say just, just something real simple. Um, the reason we do the work is because um, we've seen in every case where we talk to non-Asians or executives about this, um, they're surprised but supportive. Okay, um, that is to say, they they understand they they understand that um, diversity is important, um, equity is important, um, and so when you show the slides that that show that in fact. Asians are not as not as well represented as they think. Um, they're built, they're willing to be supportive. So um, so so data is there for people to use. Data is there to to educate. Data is there to create awareness. Um, and awareness can 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 lead to change. Yeah. One thing I wanted to add on to Buck's comment, right? When increasingly as we're looking at all this data, because the data is there, and the tools are there. We're looking across all minorities, for men and women, to see what insights we could gain. In the tech sector, for instance, where we know there's a huge population of um, Asian professional, API professionals um, across companies in this particular sector. When we looked at it, what we have seen is that the Asians and the uh, Hispanics and the Blacks have slightly different issues, right? So our issue is not about getting recruited into these companies for Asians. It is about vertical mobility, about ascension, about making it to the executive ranks. For the Black and the Hispanic Latinx population, it's really about recruitment and retention, right? And this is some of the things that when we look through the data, we see the dynamics that are happening. And this is something that we flag when we talk to company leaders and DEI professionals. I just want to mention the, the story about John Chambers. Uh, we, when we looked at the data, just an example, um, uh, and, and asked for a meeting with John Chambers, who at the time was uh, CEO of Cisco. And uh, so there were about, actually about, uh, in terms of uh, Cisco um, exec, uh, Asian executives, about 12-ish or so, um, 12, 15. And, and so we're there to, to, to talk about the Asian law ceiling, and we prepared um, a material for John to read. But he walked through, it was clear he hadn't read the the, the brief material, because the first thing he said was, yeah, I'm, I've been here at Cisco for 15 years and I'm glad so, there's so many Asian executives here at Cisco. So I, I raised my hand, I said, John, that's actually not right. And, and, I, and I just told him the numbers. And, and John said, I didn't know that. Um, and, and an hour and a half later, um, uh, we spent the hour and a half talking about it. And at the end of the meeting, John said, I didn't know this. If your numbers are right, we have a problem. We need to fix it. You need to tell me. I don't know what the I don't know what the problem is or how to fix it. You you lead you lead the, the chain, and I'll fund it. And and a couple of years later, there was a quarter million dollar development program for Asian American leaders Cisco. So kudos to John. But the point is, um, it was the data that made a difference. That we presented it to somebody who understood and and supported it. And I, I we've seen that in every every company we've talked to that people don't know, but when they find out they're supportive. What happens though, like, I think you had that access to John Chambers, right? I think in a lot of time, ERG leads, um, employees don't have that same sort of access to executives. 
Um, what would you recommend? Like what can just like, I guess, I don't want to say the average worker, but like what can ICs with ERG leads do um, with this data and like, or can, what can they do to help combat this glass, Asian glass ceiling right now? Yeah. Well, we have a slide here, Julie, that um, are kind of the one, two, three approach, right? I mean, the first thing is, I think everybody should be conversant and familiar with the data. Um, and the first thing is to understand whether or not the data actually exists for your company. So I'll start with that, because if you're going to go in and talk to executives with data, where is the data, right? Um, now, uh, several years ago, about 10 years ago, there was a move from a lot of Silicon Valley companies with Jesse Jackson coming into the area and asking tech companies, pounding their, his fist on the table and saying, you must release your diversity reporting. And many companies, uh, you know, I commend them for being uh, candid and releasing the EEO-1 report publicly, even though they didn't have to do it, right? So we started with analyzing specific companies before we found the aggregate da EEOC database. So I think the first thing you need to do is to understand what does it look like for your company? Um, some suggestions we have for uh, getting to the data is, you know, just look up on the website, see if that data is even available publicly. It, it may surprise you that uh, your company may have released it, but maybe you haven't looked at it. Um, companies increasingly are publishing their own diversity reports annually. Um, they may call it something different instead of calling it executive parity index, right? They may say leadership, for instance, as opposed to executive, but it pretty much refers to the same thing. And uh, I was glad to see that last week, for instance, Google released a very comprehensive report by regions in the globe um, and by a lot of intersectional data on how they are doing with respect to hiring, retention, and so and promotion, so on and so forth. So that's great. We need to start with the data. Sometimes you'll see these um, in uh, investor relations website. They'll talk about how many uh, executives they actually have with a picture of the executives in the C-suite. Um, you can at least see who they are. Corporate social responsibility reports sometimes is buried in there. We have seen that as well. So that's the first thing is to understand whether or not the data exists. And if it doesn't exist for your specific company, what does it look like for your industry? Just so you have a sense, right? So it might be interesting if it exists for your company to say, how do we compare? Now the question is, how do we compare either for the markets that we're trying to serve from a customer perspective or for a labor pool perspective? You know, uh, because after all, we are talking about talent pool here. And so it's the same sort of um, sources that I might suggest, but you want to analyze the data. We've given you the tool. In fact, on the Ascend website, there's an EPI calculator. <laughs> it's a very simple um, thing that you can plug in numbers and, and get a sense. And I'll, I'll say this, that really the numbers do not necessarily, even if there's a gap, right? It should suggest further questions as opposed to increasing, you know, automatically assuming that there is discrimination. I think the numbers, right, really should be the first order of raising the issue of what is going on here? Is there a gap? Um, what is accounting for the gap, right? Is it development? Um, you know, do we have a lot of, in, you know, what are some of the dynamics in hiring, for instance? You know, some companies have gone offshore, so they're not really looking at their, relying less on their U.S. labor pool, for instance, right? So that's going to cause a change and fluctuation in the underlying um, data. But you want to look at that, right? And um, so, uh, of course, um, after doing the data, you want to start to engage the company in that discussion. What Buck said in his story, I think is very telling, which is that Buck was actually one of the executive sponsors of the Asian Employee Network. And so Buck had uh, you know, the authority and the title and the creds to go to HR and say, could you share some of the data with me, right? And, and I think this is what we would advise our ERG colleagues here on the call to do is to find if you don't already have an API um, executive leader in your company, um, find out whether or not they're interested in going with you to seek this data and to uh, advocate for you. Um, maybe you already have an ERG executive sponsor. That is a right, you know, a great person to start the journey with. I mean, and 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 I th I think uh, Denise make a good, good, a good point. Go to your HR department and and I'll and I'll and I'll again just tell you another story. The when I when I when I talk to an HR person, a head of DNI at, at a company in Bay Area, they had not looked at the data this way. So 
so but when they saw it they said you're right we have a problem so 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 if you can't get the data get the get your diversity to look at it because again unless somebody asks them to look at it most companies are not looking at it this way in terms of the purport, in terms of comparison they still look at promotion rates okay but they don't compare between them and look at an inequity because that's really what it is Thank you both so much. Um, I think that was very insightful. Um, I think one, just a sort of quick question. I think, you know, when you, if you're, if you don't have an executive sponsor, if you have to do something a little bit more grassroots, and I know at Twilio, a lot of the commentary we get from our, um, our, like our, the folks in our ERG is that they don't have an, they are not advancing, they don't have enough resources. So what would you recommend? And like, what are some grassroots, grassroots, grassroots efforts um, that some of you know our ERG leads can take if they don't have that sponsorship. So yeah. I, I, I've, I've one one comment. I, well, go ahead, Denise. If you have you have something to say. Um, well, you know, ERG uh, leaders uh, put in a significant amount of volunteer hours and work to make the ERGs happen, and I actually believe that that is a development opportunity while doing good for the company and for the community. Um, I might even start with the ERG leaders going to their, um, you know, their line of uh, reporting chain and go to their leaders. Um, if their leaders are already supportive of the ERG, the question is, of, of, you know, the leaders spending time in the ERG, the question is, can you get that business leader, whether they be API or not, to be interested in this issue? Because it's really about talent, not just about diversity. It's about retaining the Asian talent that we have in the company. Uh, yeah, I, I mean that. My, that's my. Um, that to me, that is. A, if you can find somebody who wants to be a champion at that level, that's great. And again, I think um, they, they, you know, somebody like Denise or something who actually gets it and gets it and re recognize that responsibility. The second part that would help him or her, um, and even if you can't find it, is is um, is someone make the point that actually there are a number of people in the in the in the company that cares so if in fact you have a i'll say an email or a letter or whatever you want to call it a petition and you have 20 or 30 people saying hey, this is data we've seen from our industry from ascend we'd like to understand and we think there's a problem we like them in the industry we'd like to understand whether that's something there because i think um you, you can do this you, you can you can do the same thing in terms of having credibility if enough people said we care, and I because I do believe that that HR HR people and, and, and executives care about people, and if and if and if there's critical mass, not just one or two, but if you can get a critical mass of twenty or thirty or more to say this is something you'd like the company to look at, um, it'll happen. Or invite the HR leader to come to one of your ERG all hands meeting and give a presentation on what is the DEI strategy for the company. Again, the, 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 my, my perspective is uh, you, want to, you, don't want, you want to be constructive. You want to say, we want to help the company become a better company, okay? And, 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 and as long as you're doing it that way and, and are looking for solutions, uh, I think they'll be, uh, I think they'll be uh, helpful. Yeah. That's always my approach. That's a great approach, Buck. Um, so we're going to move into Q&A right now. So folks, um, there's a Slido in the chat if you have any questions for Buck and Denise. Um, while we let questions trickle in, I just want to give a big thank you. I think, you know, in terms of bringing people together, um, there was a huge team behind this event today. Um, so want to thank Ascend, want to thank ALA, want to call out Faye and Katz, um, Sam Young, Franklin Shen, um, Jay DePaz, Alaric Chin, Terry Chen, Brian Ping, Jimmy Hua, um, and all of our breakout room volunteers, um, and of course, Buck and Denise. Um, and, you know, we're really excited about this event today, and we're really thankful for all of you who are joining us tonight. And um, there, after Q and A, we will have breakout rooms. So, so I, I I'm, I'm looking at the, the the chat room. There's one question I that I, I want to answer, um, yeah. and it has to do with pipeline. And the, and the question, I'll, I'll paraphrase it this way: Maybe it's a pipeline problem. Maybe this is a problem to solve itself over time. And 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 and, I'll, and, and the answer is no. And the data, sorry, the, the data says the answer is unlikely. And the reason is two parts of data. 
The first part is that um, the, the, the ratios we see um, are very similar for old companies and young companies. You know, um, HP, Intel uh, have the same characteristics that we see at young companies like Facebook. And the average age of people at Facebook is much, much younger than at, 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 at an HP or an Intel. So there doesn't seem to be a difference between big companies and small companies, old companies, young companies. But the other, but the more telling statistic is that actually we look at, again, over time, um, we looked at from 2007 to now 2018 for the for tech companies, what you see is that we look at not just the exact level, because that may, that's a longer term thing, but also the progression into middle management or into management. So we have, as Denise says, we have management and, and, and non-management levels. And again, it's, you see minorities underrepresented. Um, but the, but telling point is that in, in the, in what, 2007 to 20, uh, to 2018, the, 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 the there's been no change. So, so there's been no change in the pipeline in, in over 10 years. And, and that's in terms of just getting into management. Um, so, um, and that, that suggests, in fact, there is no pipeline change, even at that level. So the answer is, the data does not want, suggest that there's that is pipeline problem. That's Sorry for the long answer. No, that's great. Very clear. Um, do you all know of any companies that you consider best in class for Asian Pacific Islander representation or parity? <laughs> I feel like the uh, telling. Uh, <laughs> um, some companies are doing some good things. Um, uh, the, the data does not suggest there's been a lot of change yet with regard to um, Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I, I can't. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Um, I, 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 I think, and I'll say this. I think in the last six months in the era of anti-Asian hate, I've seen some positive steps, uh, more concerned about uh, listening to the community. Um, but I think that's, that's I think, um, but, but, no, but no outcomes yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think outcomes will take a while to show up but instead of thinking about best in class results, maybe we can talk about uh, maybe some best practices. Um, I'm definitely a big supporter of uh, doing culture-based uh, leadership training. So I myself, for instance, when I was at Cisco, actually participated in a week-long leadership training and you know, a bunch of VPs were flown off to a foreign country and it was almost like a mini MBA, a lot of bonding, et cetera. And I was one of the very few Asians in this cohort uh, that got trained together um, but, you know, things were not um, completely, um, you know, I didn't feel completely comfortable in that circle. And one of the things that um, after Buck went to our CEO at Cisco with the notion that there may be some uh, lack of equity in the executive ranks in terms of representation, um, the company actually funded a uh, program, leadership development program for just AAPI professionals and managers. And that took place for about six to nine months. I was one of the executive mentors who coached a small cohort and there were probably about eight cohort teams. Um, and the story is that when they started this program, they couldn't even fill the class. They couldn't find 40 mid-level um, Asian managers who they were, uh, you know, the company had considered high potential enough to be selected for this program. So it was only after with some affirmative intervention that we were able to fill the class the class went on, there was mentoring, there were workshops, there were a number of topics um, that were discussed. Um, and it, it, a lot of it was with the notion of what does it mean to be an Asian in this context at work? And so what I can tell you is that about a year and a half, 18 to 24 months after this program ended, um, the majority, a significant majority of the cohorts actually got their next milestone promotion and uh, years later, some of them actually left the company because they actually were able to not only have more confidence and greater skill set, but found greater opportunities um, outside and inside the company. 
So that's an example of me where, uh, to me, where I think if you focus not just on generic leadership skills, but talk about what, what is it about being Asian, you know, the intersection of Asian and leadership, right, which is what we do so well at Ascend um, that I would like to bring forth to the table. Uh, I, I want to address an implicit question that's coming. I, if you have questions, please ask, ask questions. I, I'm looking at the chat and I'm, I'm yeah. seeing these implicit questions. Uh, um, and there's one, one comment um, I want to address it, um, um, in terms of Asians and being entrepreneurial in starting your own company and, and, and doing good doing company. Um, um, Wes Hom, who at the time was a VP at IBM, uh, and I uh, helped create um, the um, Advanced Leadership Program for Asian American Executives at Stanford Business School. And, and the reason we were able to create that is that we ran into a professor there, Huggy Rao, who was, was thinking about doing what he called a CEO boot camp. And the problem he was trying to solve was this. He said uh, that, uh, and he, he's Indian, South Asian. And what he was, what he was finding or what people were telling was that um, there are a lot of Asians, um, South and East Asians, start companies, but when they become real and they get, and they get into operation mode, most of them get replaced by white men. Um, and it's fundamentally the same problem that, you know, that Asians not perceived as, and in many cases, do not have the skill set to be leaders of large organizations, and that's perception. So even though um, Asians start a lot of companies, um, many of them get replaced and, and pushed into you know, the VP of engineering, the CTO, the functional role, rather than the leadership role. Um, and so you have to be careful about that, that, um, that that's, that's the same problem um, for entrepreneurs as, as corporate, leadership, corporate leaders. Um, is there any data showing that an increase in Asian representation in the C-suite leads to larger success as an organization? I have seen no um, no data in um, certainly no data to no data to to indicate that. Um, and um, uh, in fact, uh, to be controversial, okay. Um, some of the best companies in Silicon Valley, okay, when you look at the exact representation uh, of Asians in it, um, aren't great. In fact, some of the some of the worst ones. So it's hard. It's hard to me. It's hard to make that argument because because there's no data. There's no compelling data that tells me that. Okay. Um, um, uh, I, I, I don't believe, I, maybe, maybe my comment, I don't believe that there should be any interesting difference between races in terms of leadership, uh, Asian, Black, Hispanic, you know, you know women. Um, they, they all should be good. Um, and, 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 and the question is that um, why aren't Asian and men and women getting those positions if they're as good? Um, or can be as good. I will chime in here just to say too, I think there's a lot of data out there that shows like having diverse perspectives in a room, you know, helps your organization mm -hmm. really succeed. And when you don't have those diverse voices in the C-suite, you know, I think that's a, there might be a little bit of a correlation there. So I think overall it's important for us to push for mm -hmm. that diversity and that EPI um, at that yeah. C-suite level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the most recent, um, uh, one of the most recent Ascend reports that looked at board uh, leadership actually saw that in the Fortune, I believe, 500 or 1,000 companies, um, only four, there were only 4.4% of Asians in that community of uh, board of directors, right? And what that means is that the majority of companies don't actually have Asian perspectives on their board. When you consider um, not only sort of the buying power of Asians in America, but just sort of the context of being a global company and having an Asia country strategy, I think that that's a missing perspective that would hurt companies. Sure. I, I, I'm seeing on, on the chat, um, chat room, there, there's, a, there's a, a comment about East versus South Asians, and we should probably fairly address that question. Um, two, two, points, two points of data. Uh, one is that Yes, the data says that um, South Asians are doing better than East East Asians. Okay, 
um, caveat, but both are still underrepresented. Okay, and that's that's a that's a, um, a misunderstanding with many East Asian because you see a lot of them again compared to what? Okay, um, and the other comment is uh, uh, some research that was done by uh, Jackson Liu at MIT, uh, published February of last year, that looked at the difference between East and South Asians, um, and 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 he tried he he looked at four factors. Um, um, and I'll try to remember them all, Denise. One is, um, uh, is there more discrimination um, between East and South? It turns out, um, it turns out South Asians are, are more, just more, feel like they're more discriminated against. Okay, number one. Number two, um, maybe South Asians are more aspirational. And what they found in the survey of, of exactly this is that, no, that turns out that East Asians are more aspirational. Um, the difference that the difference appeared to be um, that that South Asians are more assertive, both in their management style and their behaviors, um, and that seemed to be the only difference they could find that might explain um, the, the the outcomes between South and East Asian in terms of executive management. Okay, and when we talked to Professor Liu, uh, who did this research, it was really about communication assertiveness. Uh, and I imagine that that includes uh, an expression of one's uh, career ambitions, not just being assertive in terms of business decisions and running teams. So that's something to take into consideration. Thanks for that call out. Um, I will end, we'll have one more last question. And I know there's a lot of questions, but we'll try to um, address them after before after the breakouts. But for the last question for tonight is, and Buck, you alluded to this a little bit, um, but how can you present the data to your organization without it sounding like you're trying to self-serve? Or do we need influential allies to make an impact? Um, uh, my, my, uh, so, so if you look at the data, okay, so let me answer it two ways. One is absolutely you should, you should, look, you should consider allies. Um, what, the data shows, what the data shows is that all minority men and minority women are underrepresented, not just Asian. So if you want, so so it's really easy to to, to say, look, yeah, in terms of um, um, uh, Latinx and, and, and African American in in your company, here's a problem that is, not, is clear. The data the data says is not being well addressed by this industry. Okay, you know, um, they're getting a lot of they're getting a lot of press trying to increase the numbers here. But once they're in, let's fix this problem too, and 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 so um, and, and so and, and, and my one again my one example um, was that um, uh, was that um, one company was looking at the gender glass ceiling, okay, and and so and so um, you can look at it if you if you look at the gender glass ceiling, the glass ceiling. Then, then assert yourself into that aspect of it, because the issue with the Asian women is they're the least promoted. So if you're going to fix the gender class ceiling problem, you know you got to deal with Asian women and fix that problem. As Denise said, you need cross, you need, you need both race and gender factors in that training. I would urge our ERG colleagues here to go in um, and uh, pose questions um, because the data really suggests uh, more questions to be answered and hopefully the company will be forthcoming and sharing of the data. But without the data, it's really hard to have the next conversation. Um, this is why even with the data around this, we're saying, you know, what's going on here? Where are the gaps? Where are the gaps for different communities, right? If we know that, then we can start to have a conversation about is the company aware of the gaps? What is it doing to address known gaps? Um, are there gaps that are not being covered by any diversity uh, initiatives? And if so, what should be the next step? I mean, I think having those kinds of conversations will get you a lot farther um, because the data is just the first step. And, 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 and I'd say this, because uh, going, going to get breakouts, Julie, is, is that um, the, these are problems that can only solve internal to the company. And and the ERGs right now, um, and 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 in, and executive champion executive are the only people who can make a difference. So it really is up to you. I mean, we want to change this, 
And so ERGs have to take the lead. Uh, there's ways that Ascent can help or um, th- then let us know because our, our, our goal is to help, is to help you. Um, but you've got it. You've got a champion in your company. Great. Thank you so much, um, Denise. Thank you so much, Buck. I think that was super insightful. Um, some great data and also some really great um, action items as well. Um, hold on. We're going to move into breakout rooms and you might be lucky and Buck and Denise might be in one of your breakout rooms. Um, but we definitely want everyone to stay connected with us. Um, we have the ALA, the Asian Leaders Alliance Slack channel, um, and also I send NorCal um, information up on the screen for you to sort of join and keep networking. Um, now we're going to be moving into this breakout room portion, which we want, want you all to be able to network with each other, um, you know, meet other Asian Pacific Islander leaders, share your experiences, um, and each room will have a moderator that's going to help guide the discussion. Um, and that's where we'll end the night is in the breakout rooms. So, um, Denise, Buck, I think any final words before we move into the breakouts? My only, my uh, one last word, uh, by the way, is uh, Ascend has a, has a cohort of executives like Denise. We're not the only ones here. So there's a lot of people who want to help you, but you've got to, you've got to, you've got to push and, and ask for help. Yes. I couldn't have said it better, Buck. Thank you, everybody, for paying attention. And uh, we look forward to working with you and see you in the breakout room. Thank you all. Um, So just hold on tight. Um, We'll get you into different breakout rooms. And just so you know, the breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, So feel free to really come with your whole self there and, you know, be vulnerable and share your experiences. Um, So we're going to give a little bit of time for the breakout rooms to start going.